there's no such thing as the past or future. They're both essentially illusions of our mind. And the only thing that exists is truly this present moment and this moment and this moment and this moment. So stoked to talk with Clayton today. You're even wearing a stoked t-shirt, which I think stoked is one of my favorite words. And I was on your podcast, Traveling to Consciousness, a while back. And I'm really excited to have you on this podcast to specifically dive into quantum physics and Akashic records and so much more. Clayton, welcome to the pod. Dude, thanks for having me, man. And it's an honor. I remember our podcast. I learned so much from you, man. So if I can provide your audience with one tenth of what you provided mine, I'll I could consider this a success. So thank you for having me. It's great to be here, man. Great to you're, talk to you again, too. You too. too. Yeah, you're too kind. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I mean, you're you're going to be educating me on this one and especially the listeners, a lot of us on this, because, you know, I talk about quantum physics. I just got done teaching yoga and someone came up to me afterwards mentioning what I said about quantum physics. And I didn't even realize put it together, had this podcast with you afterwards that was going to be about quantum physics. I think mostly because... I typically talk about it. and what I talk about in regard to quantum physics is how our outer world is a reflection of our inner world, right? Mm. Quantum physics teaches that. So when we look at how we, how society dictates really making us feel like needing that external validation and showing up in the world and achieving and like these grandiose dreams, it's like, well, maybe the whole thing, narrative around Dharma, per- purpose and mission, all that stuff maybe it's not necessarily true. And the real magic is to go within, find that self-love and then reflect it outwardly. So I'd love to learn from you. How did you get into quantum physics and just walk us through some of your favorite facts about quantum physics? Sure thing, man. Uh, You know, so my background is actually as like a software engineer, went to college for computer engineering, got a job as a software engineer out in San Diego, writing state-of-the-art code for military drones did that for almost four years. And I guess I'm going to give you a brief synopsis of how I got here. Um, Decided to quit my job and then started my podcast after quitting my job and kind of took off from there. And so I always kind of had this, my background was in engineering, the scientific literature, all that stuff. And there were things that kind of just kept evolving within science that I've always kind of kept up on. But then the last almost year of my life has really been diving into the scientific or the more spiritual realm of existence um, from things from like plant medicine to, you know, the and dream interpretation, you know, you can go down that whole list. Right. And where it got interesting is I started to see that it's like, you know, I started seeing science in this lens of them trying to explain the physical world. But what's interesting is that spirituality and kind of consciousness, that community sees it more in this metaphysical, like thought-based reality where we're kind of creating it. We're these co-creators of the reality. And where it got interesting is I kind of started getting to the depths of spirituality where I started seeing that intersection point where quantum physics is actually starting to explain spiritual phenomenon. Uh, Now, some of my favorite things that you kind of brought up is like, number one, and I don't know if this is a quantum physics idea, but this will be an idea that'll help us later is like the fact of time being an illusion. And this might've been one of the first books, uh, Eckhart Tolle with the power of now. It blew my mind. Just like this concept that there's no such thing as the past or future. They're both essentially illusions of our mind. And the only thing that exists is truly this present moment and this moment and this moment and this moment. And then that, so that's a fascinating one. I'm not sure if that's technically a quantum physics uh, theory, but um, if we get into the quantum physics, where all of it gets so fascinating is uh, entanglement theory and then also uh, the observer effect, which they're starting to prove with quantum physics experiments. And so really, uh, without getting too far ahead of us, you were able to combine all three of those and it kind of proves the existence of the Akashic records. Sweet. Okay. So observer theory, what was the other one? So it's observer effect. I I believe I misspoke observer effect, uh, quantum entanglement, and then the illusion of time. Entanglement and illusion of time. Okay. So 
just to be mindful of people listening, because Akashic Records and the Akashic field is a big topic. Can you explain to everyone, all of us, what the Akashic Records are, talk about the field and all of that, and then maybe we can dive into those three elements you just mentioned? Absolutely. It's a, it's a great idea. So the way that I was introduced to the Akashic Records, and it's interesting because when you start talking about these metaphysical things, we all can have slightly different explanations of it. The way that I was taught about it and it made sense to me was that there's, imagine a library, imagine an infinite library that has books on the history of everybody's souls, the history of the universe, the planets, the solar systems, every galaxy in existence. And this library basically holds the, to summarize, holds the past, future, the past and future of everything that exists in everything <laughs> and everywhere I'm having a hard time explaining this because it's everything right and the way that i believe we conceptualize this is as a library so it's a field of information that holds the nature of everything in totality and i'm kind of talking over myself but i feel like it's one of those things you kind of got to say it a few different ways um so then as humans, as humans, we have libraries where we see as knowledge. So then as humans, the picture or the image of a library is what we can use to understand this information field. Yeah, absolutely. I've worked with uh, Akashic Records readers for the past three years. I've probably had like five and six different ones and done a total of nearly 15 calls. I haven't done one in a while. It's been... Um, been at least uh I, I don't think i've done one this year which is weird but uh, just different season you know for me it's been integration in the past three years of going deep within the inner journey and now bringing it back to more tangible like practical accessible stuff for the mainstream and being that bridge if you will so i just love seeing you go so deep and even you doing akashic records calls and everything now in terms of opening up the records like what dimension is this and i always forget what dimension the akashic field's in man again this is it's a great question but again does anyone know anyways right well man yeah. like this is the thing is like it's it differs from person to person so okay. like i've talked to people and um you know i'll start explaining this is a different realm the astral realm which is essentially where you lucid dream or astral project and i've heard people call it the shaman realm and mm -hmm. I've heard other people call it something else. And even the definition of what astral projection is, I've heard that differ from person to person. So, you know, when you get to this kind of thing, it's different for everybody. Uh, so personally, I identify it as the Akashic realm. Um, and so I visualize it kind of as this realm that's, man, and see, here's where it gets weird, especially with like a, from a quantum physics perspective is like, you know, our our three-dimensional mind tries to think like, okay, where is this thing? But the answer right. is, is that it's right here, you know, yeah, it's like yeah, yeah. all around us. So it's, it's, it becomes difficult in that regard. Yeah. That's funny. You bring that up because a lot of times I think about it, it's like, is the Akashic field in the seventh dimension? They say, and the only reason why I think about it is to your point, like it doesn't matter and I don't really care and doesn't really change anything. Right. I just remember hearing it. I think it was maybe in Matias de Stefano's um, uh, series on Gaia, what is that called? Initiation, which is a great uh, series on Gaia. If you aren't familiar with Gaia, anyone listening, definitely check out Gaia. It's like Netflix for spirituality, mindfulness, and all the quantum fun stuff. And there's this dude, uh, Matias De Stefano, that remembers all his past lives. And I mean, when we come into Earth, we go through this veil forgetting. Yes, I know other people who ha remember things, right? But he remembers it so specifically where he remembers his time in Chem, which that's a town in uh, Atlantis that he grew up in. He, he sung on Aubrey Marcus's podcast, Atlantean songs and all kinds of stuff. So, I mean, depending on where you're at in your journey, that might be a little too woo for other people check him out he's absolutely incredible shout out to my good friend celeste she's homies with them and um, it's all great stuff so in terms of the akashic records specifically like opening up and gaining the knowledge and tapping into the library of the soul how did you learn to enter that realm it's a great question and i had a great teacher who i've had on my podcast uh by the name of danny west who she's, you know, she's, this is like her thing. Like she just dives into the Akashic record. She's like a certified reader and everything. 
And so she, she kind of taught me, uh, now, you know, I'm not going to do it any justice, but you know, it's fascinating because I feel like the simplest way is just set your intention to do it. You kind of just, it's a combination of just setting your intention to do it and then having the trust or faith that you are doing it. And that might sound a little, I don't know kind of how that sounds, but that sounds like it's too easy or too good to be true. But Mm -hmm. in this weird sense, man, like we're kind of, we're told a lot of things as kids that I believe that shapes our reality shapes the way we view things that we discount things as not being real that are very much real and um the first time i actually accessed the realm i did a meditation and the whole story of it's wild in its own right but long story short you know i basically used a guided meditation that showed me how to open up the realm how to get in there um you know becoming grounded becoming centered and here's the deal. Like at some level, you do need to be of the same frequency of the records to access them. So like, you know, I I doubt it's going to be anyone on your podcast, but hypothetically speaking, if someone's listening to this and they've got so much shit going on in their life from that, they're holding guilt and shame and, you know, just a lot of heavy stuff from this life. Like they've got other stuff to worry about before accessing the Akashic records. Mm -hmm. Um, So, and it's not to say they can't do it. They can absolutely do it. It's just that there's, other stuff that's holding them into this physical density, this third density, this third dimension, physical realm, that's going to prevent their mind from being able to access it. And again, they can do it. It's just that the, you have to have that belief there that kind of gets stripped away from us in, you know, growing up and being told that it's not real. Yeah, totally. So making it a bit more practical, like when you enter meditation and you're in the Akashic field, uh, how do you know, like you're in there? Are you starting to ask questions? Are you listening for answers? Are you, I know that different people receive information differently, but for you, what's your experience in navigating the field and what do you gain from entering the Akashic realm? Great, great questions. So I do have like a little invocation that I have, and it depends if I'm accessing the records for myself or for someone else, I'll kind of alter the invocation a little bit so that it would be like, you know, I'm accessing this information uh, for Sam, you know, versus I'm accessing this information for Clayton. And so I start off with an invocation and then usually somewhere along in the invocation, I'll start kind of getting this like tingling feeling of, man, it's so hard to, it's not hard to explain, but it's just, it's an interesting feeling of like tingling and feeling lighter, feeling like you're kind of like taking on more energy than you're usually you're used to. And um, it's interesting because as I'm kind of going through it and then I get to a point where I say like the records are open and for myself, I'm primarily clear audience. So Mm -hmm. to me, if you ask a question, uh, words are just going to keep start coming into my head. And so I basically just repeat the words that I essentially hear. Uh, There are times, like you were saying, there are times I receive it in different ways where I'll feel energy kind of either like shoot up my legs and into my heart. Or uh, there was one time where I started feeling a surge of energy in my hands. And these are things that all pertain to the individual. So like the one for hands, I was kind of like, you know, I'm getting a tingling in my hands. Like, uh, and before I even finish it, the guy's like, oh, that's weird. Like I am too. (laughs) I'm like, Mm. I'm like, dude, it's because we're connected, you know? And so I'm asking him like, you know, have you ever done anything with your hands that you've been meaning to get back to? And he's like, yeah, like I've always written when I was a kid and I haven't written in a while. And I'm like, well, why'd you stop? And he's like, I have no idea why I stopped. Like, and I'm like, that could be, you know, helpful for this person. And, um, you know, he was super energized about it. And I, I think it helped him in those regards. And so, you know, there's a, there's a very interesting energy that kind of comes over you. Uh, of just like this, it's kind of like this knowing it's this energy, energy, it's this vibration. And even to expand a little bit further, whenever I, it's interesting, because there's like different levels of it, where there's times where I'm like really tapped in. And then there's times where I'm kind of just starting to get tapped in. And once I get to that place of being really tapped in, it feels this might sound crazy, but it feels like there's almost this division that kind of goes across like my head. Um, so like my lips down feels like it's Clayton, but then from my like lips up feels like I'm kind of connected to this other source, this mm-hmm. other being. And so where it gets interesting is in my readings, 
I'll be hearing things and I'll be conversing with the person in this physical dimension. And I'm like, okay, this is Clayton talking now, <laughs> like, like Clayton saying this, uh, so take it or leave it. But then there's other times where I'll like tap into what the words are telling me. And I'm like, you know, it, it's interesting because I can tell that there's a shift of energy whenever there's um, based on the information that's coming through. Yeah. That, thank you for taking the time to explain that. And that, that makes sense with the hands and how it resonated with someone else and why that came to you. Um, one thing that I'd like to touch on is safety, because, you know, this isn't something, you know, all this stuff's when we're talking metaphysical, like, you know, it sounds, depending on where you're at, it might sound like totally nonsense and unbelievable for other people into this stuff. It might sound extremely intriguing and you want to go deeper. And if you are someone that wants to go deeper and learn, like say the Akashic records or channeling in general, what type of safety procedures do you, you need to come back to really make sure that you're working with beings of light and love? Because sometimes I've heard of stories I haven't necessarily experienced to my knowledge, right? That I've had voices or different beings come through that were say archons reptilians or just not uh of light and love and they can be deceptive there's this book um i forget what it's called something like how the arcturians are saving the world or something it's a whole book okay. about how this guy was channeling the arcturians uh, to work with arcturians to perform exorcisms and remove reptilians from people and through him learning how to do this he discovered how the reptilians were really uh creative and clever about deceiving people that they were like say a good being or a good reptilian and then something would happen and they'd need to get them out so how do you use that discernment when channeling yeah that's a dope question and i'm actually going to pull up my uh I'm going to pull up my Akashic record uh, intention. Um, I'm trying to remember what I saved the, the file as. Oh, there it is. Um, but it's a really good question uh, because this is something that I actually address in my uh, pathway. And I'm not going to read through the entire thing, but you know, there's a section in here where I literally say, I ask to be shielded from meddling spirits and entities. I ask to set aside my third density mind and ego to enable me to become a clear and grounded channel and source for all knowledge. And so it's, again, it's just, it's, it's putting that intention in what you're doing. Like you can absolutely, by all means use, you know, this knowledge for the wrong, you know, reasons. Like I know that there's people on this planet who do that. And, you know, it's, that's a whole another interesting philosophical conversation. But the point being is that like, you know, there's a whole piece in here about, you know, what my intention is. Like, I want to raise my frequency. I want to help all the people that I'm connected with. Uh, so there is a level of that. There is also a level of every time I work with people, I'm like, anything I say is a hundred percent your mm -hmm. discernment uh, because I really want to empower other people. This isn't about me. It's not about my abilities. It's about the person I'm trying to help. I'm trying to empower them. So like, if I say something that's absolutely crazy and you're like, there's no way that's true, like, believe that, like, that's your truth. Like, that's what you needed to hear. Maybe you needed to develop your ability to say no. Um, it's interesting though, because like, that was something I was taught, but I really haven't encountered anyone who has like had that pushback. Um, so I don't uh, know. What, what was that? Something that you're taught and pushback? What was that part piece of it? Sure. I was like, I was taught whenever I was uh, working with Danny about you know, making sure people know that like all of this is up to them. Like it's a hundred percent your, like you discern if this information is for you or not. And I've never like in all, I mean, I don't know, I'm, I'm probably haven't been doing this too long to say in all my years. Uh, but you know, it's, I've worked with enough people where I feel like I should have gotten that by now, but again, maybe it just comes back to the intention. It goes back what do you, to Clayton. What do you mean by gotten that? Oh, <laughs> good good call uh gotten the pushback that it didn't resonate with someone like oh usually got the, it i see like usually the messages that are coming through are usually like validating almost to what the person already kind of knew which is where it gets also interesting it's so true and you know i'm glad you make a big deal about using your own discernment because i think it's so important because oftentimes we look outside of ourselves and a close friend of mine has reflected to me how I do that a lot, how I look outside myself by going to say a Chandler or Akashic Records reader and looking for things, right? And, and we need to find ways to go within. 
one thing I will give myself credit for is when I do work with a uh, channeler, yes, I'm going outside of myself to work with someone else to bring that through, but I don't see that as 100% truth. I sit and feel into it, whether it's in my body or anything else, and see how it feels. So I'm happy you bring that up. I actually just mentioned how I got done teaching yoga. And in my yoga classes, I was trained through interdisciplinary yoga. That's the style I was trained in specifically it's about how you are your own best teacher so i always make space in the class for them to be their teacher and to feel into their body because so many of us are caught up on yang yang energy right or yang yang and if we look at work-life balance we see that it's just all about uh, that yang energy and that's my message of soul life balance to bring the yin energy in. what is yin it's intuition right it's flow so if we can have those moments it's as simple as going to yoga class and feeling into your body and taking time for yourself. So I, I love that you bring that into Akashic Records because that is so much deeper than just going to a yoga class. And I will say uh, as well, I just remembered that one of my last Akashic Records calls was right before I released and published my recent book, Soul Life Balance in February 22nd, 22. And I think you were getting ready to go to Egypt. I don't remember, but I know we talked around then. I feel like Anyways, uh, this, this channeler I was working with said something about how I'm here to use my voice. And I go, yeah, I know that, you know, cause I've had so many different channelers telling me that, and my human design is manifester. And there's been like my astrology, everything comes back to my voice. So she kind of made a joke and was like, well, why aren't you then? And I took offense <laughs> to it. So when you talk about like pushback, like that was like, I got off that call and I was I was offended because I was like, okay, I've done over 500 podcasts at this point with doing podcasting since 2017, my different various shows have had YouTube shows just sure. was preparing for my fourth book. And then I sat in it and I was like, it helped me remember that I wanted to get into public speaking and I, I've totally forgot. And that's what launched my public speaking career. So even something like that, where it did bring up resistance, if we feel that resistance and we just don't have the tools to surrender, then we'll, we're just going to resist more. So can we surrender and go a bit deeper? hundred percent, man. And, and that resistance that let's call it triggering even because that's like mm -hmm. the buzzword that's kind of there. It's so powerful to look at what triggers you in life, because that can be like your next step into evolving who you are, getting to the next step of your evolution. And the other interesting thing that comes up that I'm thinking about is uh, the specificity of words that you use whenever you are being or consulting the records is tremendously important, right? Because, um, you know, you know, the, the difference, like you could ask, like, how old am I? And the universe could say that you're 28 years old. You could say, you know, or maybe you say, you maybe you say, how long have I been on earth? And the universe says 28 years, but then it says, how old am I? And it's like, since the beginning of time, you know, so mm -hmm. even just that specificity, and it seems like a small tweak can give you such a different outcome. And so to the, my point is, is like, even with your question of like, you know, even if, you would switch that to like, how can I better use my voice or find a way to articulate the sentence a little bit differently will give you like a vastly different outcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. That's it. words are spells too. And uh, all that good stuff. So shifting gears from Akashic records and going back to quantum physics, can you tell us how the observer effect, the quantum, uh, I forget what you called it and the illusion of time, those three things you brought up at the beginning, can you bring that back? Absolutely. Um, so the I, I don't know if we've talked about entanglement or quantum entanglement. And um, as a quick summary, and I highly recommend everyone to research this even deeper if what I say is confusing. But uh, through the experiments that they've done with like splitting particles and then measuring the way that they interact with each other across space instantaneously. And I know that might not be if you're like, what the hell is he talking about? That's not the best description of it. I know. Uh, but the point is, is that they figured out that the fact that I'm speaking right now, like no matter what I'm saying is instantaneously having an effect on a star on the other side of the universe at the same time. So everything you do, everything you say can have this ripple effect that reaches out instantaneously across the universe. So now let's also couple this with the idea of like, you know, in order for Clayton Kiteri and Sam Caber to be sitting here having a podcast 
everything that has ever occurred in the history of everything had to occur, right? Everything from, you know, I don't know if dinosaurs are still a hot button issue, but from the dinosaurs being on earth to them being extinct to uh, Christ and the rise of the Christian or Catholic church to, you know, you know, fill in the blanks in order for us to be sitting here having this conversation, every single one of those things had to occur. Now, maybe they didn't have to happen specifically, but the point is, is that all of those things did occur to get us here. Then brings us to the fact that there is this energy, let's say that if we're able to tap into it, would have the blueprint for everything that has ever occurred. And if you know everything that has ever occurred, you are able to then figure out everything that will ever occur. And something that's coming to mind is that this may actually, a big uh, proponent to this would be the idea of multiple dimensions, right? If there's multiple timelines, um, like there's a timeline exists where maybe Jesus didn't incarnate, but it's a pretty big thing that occurred, but who knows, right? Mm -hmm. So hypothetically, there would be a different timeline that would occur that get us to a different timeline. Um, damn, I really feel there's like I'm a, going off topic here. You're good. There's a really good movie. Um, not everything everywhere all at once. That's a good movie too. And I'll get to that, but there's another one. I don't know why the word convergence is coming in. Cause I don't think what it's called. Let me see if I can bring it up real quick. Um, but there's this movie that's probably from the early two thousands about how a comet came into this dinner party. And then that comet sent everyone on their own timeline it's it's really fascinating Interesting. and i'm googling it right now and maybe it is convergence but i will put the link to the movie the name of the movie in the show notes because i don't remember what it is and i want to stay focused on the podcast but it's such a good film that explains timelines and different things occurring and how people are popping in and out of timelines and if anyone listening is uh, interested in this the movie everything everywhere all at once that just came out this year is a great film as well that explains alternate realities and I don't remember the movie that well. I don't remember loving it as much as a lot of people. There's something about it that didn't resonate with me. I think it was because if I'm getting this right, they were talking about alternate universes. However, if I memory serves me right, the movie was more alternate timelines. Did you see that movie? Oh yeah. I've seen it a couple of times. Right. Like, um, was it alter alternate universes? Is that the terminology they used? I believe you're right because they show that because the way that they illustrated it on that um, dude's wrist was kind of like as if they were moving to a different universe as opposed to it looking like a, a timeline jump. Yeah. And, you know, this is just I'm always questioning my beliefs. And I think it's important that we all question our beliefs. And the part with me that, you know, I'm very I, I'm a my partner, she calls me a stickler, you know, and that's actually my archetype in terms of my self-sabotage assessment quiz. And if you guys are interested in self-sabotage, listen to a previous podcast with the title self-sabotage. It's incredible, but my self-sabotage is stickler and I get hung up on things. Right. So I get hung up on this and this thing where it's like, it's an alternate universe. I'm like, well, that doesn't align with my belief system because to me, these are the ego identities that would technically be in an alternate timeline within this universe and outside of this universe that ego consciousness wouldn't exist that soul would and that's my belief system does that make sense well so here's what's coming to mind for me right is this goes back to what we were talking about earlier we use different words when we start getting to this like esoteric nature this metaphysical nature different words can mean different things because we don't mm. have we almost don't have the language for them so they can say universe. And for like me, you know, like maybe, and I mean, take this or leave this, but maybe you have an attachment to the word of universe versus timeline. Whereas me, I was kind of just like, oh, like, you know, they're in a separate timeline. Like it was, it was kind of like synonymous in my head with what they were describing. Although there definitely is power in words. So I will give you that if we definitely need to make sure we're all on the same page of words. Um, right. Because like theoretically, right. There could be multiple different universes that are existing simultaneously within one timeline, right? I assume that's where you're going with that. 
Yeah, exactly. And I mean, not to get hung up on that, that but one thing I, I love about the movie, I forget exactly what it was, but they had this bagel thing. And at first <laughs> I thought it was like silly and dumb and it was whatever. And then I was like, you know what? I actually, I actually really like that because it was like a good cosmic joke and cosmic giggle and light hardness of it all. And it wasn't so heavy as say something like the matrix. Uh, but yeah, that's it. It's if you're interested in this type of stuff, definitely check out everything everywhere all at once. Uh, obviously the matrix uh free guy with ryan reynolds that was a really good one as well have you seen that one i have not watch it it's so good yeah basically uh there's a npc non-playable character in the movie that's in like stuck in a video game essentially and then he wakes up to the fact that he is an npc and uh, it's a comedy so it's lighthearted and it's, it's really good explanation of all this stuff and just seems like more and more often we're seeing uh more consciousness in our programming right you look at the movie soul by pixar or even the movie onward that's a great one too so many good ones but shifting gears Tell us about your Egypt journey, because I believe you went to Egypt earlier this year and you had some profound shifts. Is that right? Oh, for sure. I had profound shifts and uh, a couple of profound stories. Uh, the one story, um, and this was kind of before maybe I was fully embodying the idea that I was clear audience. So still stepping into that. I was, this is actually whenever I meditated in the pyramid. So um, I was with my dad. And my dad is uh, a little overweight. He's working on it. So I was like a little nervous because we were about to split directions. You know, we went up to the, uh, the Giza Plateau and I was like, I want to go into the pyramid. I want to meditate. Um, you know, you go do your thing. I'll go do mine. We'll meet up at the Sphinx a little bit later. And so I was like, okay, like he knows where he's going. We know where we're meeting up. I go into the pyramid and get up to the, the king's chamber, sit down to meditate. I put an alarm on my phone for 28 minutes because uh, if you've ever read the law of one, they talk mm -hmm. about not being in there longer than 30 minutes. That's a whole nother thing. Uh, but so I set my alarm for 28 minutes so that I could meditate for that much time. And so I sit down and honestly, pretty quickly, right? This was even before my Akashic records. I felt that jolt of alignment that I was speaking about that I now can induce uh, consciously. Um, whenever I was in the pyramids and I remember kind of just sitting there and I kind of just started asking, I kind of just asked a question and I forget what the questions were, but I was asking all these different questions and someone, something was talking to me. Um, I asked their name and I think it was like Anaka or something like that. Anaka can't find any literature about it, um, about her or this being. So I found that interesting, but where the story kind of picks up is that, you know, I get to a point and I'm like, okay, for my highest self, like, what should I do next? And Anak is like, you should leave. And I'm like, okay, yeah, like, I'll, I'll do that at some point. And I'm like, okay, so what should I do for like my highest self? And she goes, go help your dad. Hmm. And I'm like, yeah, okay, like, I'll, I'll help him. But like, I just started meditating, like, I'll help him later. And she's like, she's like, you need to go help your dad. And like, for some reason, the third time she said it, I was like, okay, let's go. Um, so I get up, I leave, uh, I get down the pyramid, I'm walking down the plateau and in front of the Sphinx is a giant courtyard. Now it's super easy to see everybody that's in this courtyard. Cause it's pretty much flat. And as I'm coming down the hill, I don't really see my dad anywhere. I'm like, okay, this is interesting. So I'm like looking around the courtyard, don't see him. I sit down and I'm like, there's no way I could have passed him because it's like, a, it's a pretty much a straight shot. And so then I pick up my phone to like call him. And the instant I pick him up, I actually get a text from him. And the text is something along the lines of like, hey, headed back to the hotel, um, uh, just so you know. And the hotel was right behind us. Like we were kind of staying at one of those inns that like overlooks the pyramid, uh, um, the plateau. And so I'm like, all right, this is weird. And I remember Anaka's voice being like, go help your father. And so I'm like, all right, I'll go help my father doesn't by the text doesn't seem like he really needs any help um and so i go back to the pier i go back to the uh inn and i walk in and my dad's sitting on the couch in the um sitting on the couch in the in the lobby and i'm like okay like is everything okay dad he's like yeah 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 it was just like getting hot and you know i got my sketching done so like i'm good 
I'm like, all right, well, what do we want to do? He's like, let's change and then eat. So we walk up the stairs, um, we get into our room and the instant he walks into the room, he just runs to the bathroom and just starts vomiting like violently. I'm like, what the fuck just happened? And I'm like asking him what's wrong. He's like sweating profusely. He's like all red. I'm like, dad, like what's, what's wrong. And he's like, I don't, I don't know. He's like, I might be dehydrated. So I like ran, got him some bananas, got him some water. Um, and so then he like, just kind of napped for like 20 minutes after drinking and eating that. And as he was napping, I started meditating again. <laughs> I just hear Anaka's voice, like, like, good job. Like you did it. So I'm like, I'm like, what the fuck is that? I was like, that was the most ridiculous thing that I've ever experienced. Hmm. Oh, yeah. So that that was a pretty crazy uh, experience in itself where, you know, I had this extra worldly voice, let's say, telling me to go help my dad. And then, um, yeah, him actually needing my help after the fact. That is fascinating. And I see behind you, too, I was going to ask you because you have the Egyptian god for anyone uh, listening. Uh, he's got uh, Clayton's got a poster uh, framed uh, picture beautiful of the Egyptian god Anubis with his onk there and the onk, the Egyptian onk, I believe that represents life, right? Yeah. And and Anubis, what's that? The key to life. The key to life. Um, so Anaka, Anaka, that's what it sound like. And, you know, I, I thought the story was going to go in some direction where, you know, maybe he had a heart attack and you saved him or something like a little bit more extreme, but still like that's, uh, you had a lot of synchronicities there. Absolutely. So a, a lot to, it's a lot to pile up and I never right. made the connection between Ankh and Anaka. So that's actually, right. that's actually a very interesting correlation that I have not thought of before. Yeah. And the Nubis, I have a friend who spent uh, a couple of weeks with Matias de Stefano actually um, in the pyramids around that same time. I think it was February 22nd. Yeah. Of this year. And oh, wow. uh, that's probably when I was there. Yeah. I think it was around the time. Yeah. Were you there for Matias's thing or? No, I mean, I just kind of went with my dad on our own thing. Yeah, Matthias uh, brought like, I think 2000 people, uh, give or take and divide them up, I believe in the elements, and they all had like different songs to sing in the pyramids. And um, my friend, she was in the pyramids meditating, and she had, I don't remember, it's her story, but essentially like the Ouroboros came and then Anubis came and then she started seeing um, Anubis a lot and Anubis represents uh, like kind of like the afterlife, right? Yeah, he's the god of uh, mummification and death do you yeah go ahead yeah uh i think what you're gonna ask is like for some reason this dude like resonated with me very hard like i was very infatuated with seeing anubis things finding anubis things there was um i want to find uh an anubis so if anyone's listening and they have one of these i'm willing to pay top dollar for it uh a red granite anubis sitting in the king's position holding his onk i Mm. had i searched everywhere for it but but what's interesting is anubis really isn't pictured and many of their hieroglyphs, like very rarely at all. Uh, it's pretty much just like the final judgment scene where they actually he's actually depicted. And then a couple times here and there. But for the most part, the guy is not like painted and he's a very rare character to come up. And so I always found yeah. that very fascinating about him. Same, same. Absolutely. And I think then that final judgment of uh, scene that you're talking about, he's there with Thoth, right? And they kind of have the scale. Yeah. Yeah, the scale yeah. scale of justice, maybe. Um, but yeah, that they're weighing the right. heart against an ostrich feather. Wait, tell us that story. I've heard that, but I don't know it well. Sure. Uh, so, I mean, the core concept, I can give you a high level overview. I'm sure there's more details. But the core concept is, is that when you die, um, they'll measure the way your heart on the scales, right? It's like the scales of justice, the way your heart. And, and this was like what the ancients did was like they would when they would create mummies, they would take out all the organs, but they would leave the heart. And the point was, is that you needed the heart in the afterlife for the scales of justice. Mm. So they would put your heart on the scale and then put an ostrich feather on the other side. And something that's very fascinating is that an ostrich feather is the only feather of any bird that is asymmetrical. So it's even on both sides. Hmm. And so the concept is, is that if your heart was lighter than an ostrich feather, you got to move on into heaven. If it wasn't, then you were kind of damned to... I'm not sure if they really truly believed in reincarnation, but it was essentially that you had to like go to hell and like relive your life essentially until your heart was lighter than an ostrich feather. So you could move on. And 
I'm not sure what Anubis is. I mean, Anubis is mostly like in the mummification process and he's depicted in that scene. Um, but he, he, he's kind of just in that scene. I'm not sure that he really had a whole lot of um, <laughs> power in figuring out who goes where, you know? Yeah, I don't know that much about it either, but that's really fascinating. So for your time in Egypt, what did your integration look like when you came back? And did things start to open up for you even more? That's a good question. Um, I think it was probably about the time where I started to take my Claire audience more, more seriously, especially because, you know, a big piece of my journey has been actually like trusting just trusting things in general, whether it's, I've seen it manifest in relationships and I saw it even just manifest with my trust in the universe. Like this idea of a divine being, I mean, from before easily before February, like I would say that I believed in these things, but to say that I fully trusted it would have probably slightly been a little bit of a lie. And so I think that that experience that we were talking about in the pyramids, it really unlocked my faith. Like, okay, it's not like I'm just it's not like I'm making up these words in my head. Like mm -hmm. there's actually something coming in that is giving me guidance or telling me something that actually needs to be heard. And somehow this led to the Akashic records and that trust keeps getting doubled down every time I work with someone because I say something and there've been times where I'm like, you know, I'll say something and I'm like, that didn't make any sense to me, but their eyes are like lit up and they're like, holy shit. Like I knew exactly what that means. And I'm like, okay, cool. Like, like that's all I need to hear. Awesome. Yeah. I love so, that. Yeah. Well, Clayton, this is awesome. We have touched on so many different topics from Egypt to Anubis and, you know, quantum physics, quantum physics, getting into that Akashic records and so much more. If you had one message for anyone listening that kind of like encapsulates all of this and a uh, sort of maybe not call to action, but you know, that soul life balance where it's either being in it or taking action. What would you say like the main takeaway from what you're trying to do with uh, your Akashic records, reading your podcast, traveling to consciousness and so much more? What would that one thing be? Listen to your internal guide and that will manifest differently for other people, whether it's hearing voices, whether it's, you know, what energizes you usually feeling the energy within you is a big one. But like, like you just said, right, we went over all these things. And quite frankly, I feel like I did a poor job of explaining the whole combination of quantum physics to the Akashic records. But what I'm thinking is, is that maybe there was a point there. Like this could be your thing. If like you, this could be that nugget that's one of your audience members needs where they get really energized by that thought. And this is what precludes them to actually go and do more research on their own. So, you know, for someone, maybe it's the quantum physics for someone, maybe it's the Anubis, right? But pay attention to these things. I would say pay attention to these things throughout your life and say, you know, what, what is like pulling my energy towards it? What am I trying to learn more from? And at the end of the day, use your discernment because, you know, you're the master of your reality and whatever you say goes. <laughs> Yeah, that resonates with me so much. And I think it's so important to find the tools to slow down so that we can listen. And, you know, the example I'm, I'm going back to currently is like going to the yoga teacher training last year, November, December changed my life, you know, and I never thought I would, I thought about going to yoga teacher trainings, but I never saw myself as a teacher. You know, I always was like, yeah, that'd be kind of cool. That'd be good for my soul development. And then when I was there, I decided to want to teach and do men's work. And really in all the work I've done since first drinking ayahuasca in April of 2019, like that yoga teacher training, I went there being like, this is my integration to get back into like normal society for my soul development and kind of mm. step out of that deep, deep, deep inner journey. But I never would have anticipated the transformation that happened. And it was all the synchronicities that led me there. It was the listening, it was the slowing down, it was connecting with the intuition. So I can't agree with that more. Thank you for sharing that. And final thing for you, I know you have an app. So speak to us about your app. Yeah, Traveling to Consciousness app. It basically has any articles I write, which I want to write a few more in the future, but it hasn't been my priority right now. It has some digital courses, some med meditation uh, tapes. Uh, we've got all the podcasts on there. And really my whole thing is like, I put my podcast out there on all the streaming platforms, uh, but there are ads in them. So I was like, you know, I need to find a way that 
the real dedicated people who don't want ads who can just like listen to the mm. streamline of consciousness i was like this makes sense so you know there's like monthly subscriptions if you want to jump in and um listen to that and it, i mean it's great it's like just my own little space to just kind of put out anything that i want to create and you know it's like it, it's kind of like developing that next level of people who want to who want to just connect further oh and it's so cool too because you can leave comments and this is what i love about it you can leave comments underneath like uh the like either podcasts or the articles and so anyone else that's in there reading them can also be like all right like what else are what are people thinking about this like where's the conversation and and so i see it as even more powerful than you know even you know listening to spotify or listening to these other things because there's not really that option unless you're on youtube and even more so you know <laughs> there's right. toxic elements out there and so. luckily they don't find their way to the app you know it's like they're not if they if they think that i'm spreading the devil's work or <laughs> um you know some crazy guy then it it's kind of like this barrier that is able to separate me from those people yeah that's so cool that you have your own app i'm going to make sure i check it out and i love that you have the community portion as well is there a place in the app to like send direct messages with people that's a good question i don't believe that that exists did you build this app yourself or is it like a third party one of those it's a third party yeah, yeah, so I'll have to reach out to them and be like, hey, um, you know, can you guys can you guys add this feature? Because that would be a really cool feature to add. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, you know, the community element to me, I feel like is one of the most important parts of the spiritual awakening process. Right. Because if you oh, don't have sure. people you can talk to, that's really where it starts to get extremely lonely and you start to question like, what, what, what the hell are we doing here? What, what am I doing here? And am I losing my mind? Right. And once you find <laughs> that community, I know for a lot of us, that's why they listen to podcasts like yours and mine, which guys check out the show notes to go to traveling to consciousness.com. That's the name of Clayton's podcast. That's also the website traveling to consciousness and show notes. You can just click it right there. So it's so much more easy to do that. And I also have um, links to connect with Clayton a bit deeper from his newsletter and also his Akashic records reading. So be sure to check those out as well. Clayton, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the pod. I really appreciate everything you shared with us about the Akashic Records, quantum physics, Egypt, and all of it. These conversations are so much fun. I love it. I appreciate you having me, man. And yeah, again, I if anyone took away anything, then it was a success in my mind. So hopefully, whether it's inspired action, whether it's whatever, just thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I know you're putting together an amazing group of people that are, I'm sure, listening to this and Honestly, it was a big reason I even started my podcast in the beginning was that I just, I wanted to talk to like-minded individuals Same. and here you are sitting across, you know, on the other side of America and we get to have this conversation. So, you know, my life's a success by all measures because I'm able to, able to have these conversations. I love it, brother. I love it. That's so cool. Well, we'll have you on again soon and we'll be in touch and thank you guys all. For